Dear friends, welcome to the press conference for Le Mans 66, a James Mangold film. And without further ado, let me please introduce to you Mr. Christian Bale. first question to be about basically what attracted you to the script, the story, the characters, but no, because the film stayed so much with me when I saw it, unexpectedly so, I must say, that I was wondering, in a way, how powerful was the experience to each of you, thinking about it with a sort of retrospect. Oh, uh, not at all. The, no, I'm kidding. The, uh, it was powerful. It was, um, it was... I don't think power would be the word I felt making the movie. I think it's it's a you know the challenge of making the film is uh, at least for the director every day is a monumental uh, set of challenges every day that you're not sure if you can do or whether you'll accomplish. But uh, but the feeling making the movie was camaraderie. I mean the thing that I think that came through making the film that is in the film is that these guys who I've known a long time that the crew I've worked with a long time that there was a that we're all friends, and that that um, if there's anything I think that came through in the movie that was most important to me was the feeling of friendship, of camaraderie, of accomplishing something together. You know. What about you, my Damon Christian Bale? I think you know there's yeah there's a, a definite a shared obsession uh, between these characters in, in having that. Uh, a common purpose. They live life in a very raw manner. I mean, literally, not knowing if they were going to get out of the car, and um, and that and that um, made them incredibly alive. Uh, and uh, and so it transcended the whole notion of just being a racing movie. But it is this story about friendship, you know, told at 200 miles an hour. What about you, man? Yeah, I think uh, <clears throat> I, I agree. And the the, the way in for me definitely was about as Jim was alluding to. Because uh, I'm not a car person, and I don't think any of us are particularly car people, but um, but we do spend our lives collaborating creatively with groups of people and trying to make things together, and so that was very relatable. And uh, and I think it's a, Jim made something that's a lot more than a car movie. Obviously, I, um, um, I, I don't think any of us would have done it without. Uh, and and also, I mean, in terms of the, I mean, a lot of your problems as an actor get solved when you have a director. Like this, Steven Soderbergh once described directing to me as, as uh, making a, a giant mosaic the size of a city block from an inch and a half away. And, uh, and they, they have to keep so many things in their head and understand what every moment, what specific moment, what place it has in the film and keep the giant picture. So, so any notes that he would give us or adjustments were so specific because he knew exactly what he needed to tell the story. Question here. Bonjour. Dans ce que vous montrez dans le film, la quête du Mans par Ford ressemble beaucoup à la quête de la Lune par la NASA à la même époque. J'aimerais savoir si vous avez l'impression d'avoir fait un film d'astronaute sur la route. Et corollairement, j'aimerais savoir quelle était la dimension symbolique qu'avait pour vous le Mans, la course du Mans, personnellement. Merci. What is the question? Oh, you have it put okay. <laughs> well, no, 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 no. The, the film, I mean, uh, the quest uh, by Ford, like to win uh, Le Mans, was very much like the quest that NASA had at the same time for the moon, so to speak. Uh, did you feel while making the, the film to be like a bit like astronauts on the road, the quote? And did, did you give Le Mans, what was to you Le Mans symbolical dimension or maybe metaphorical dimension? Well, I'll, I'll volunteer that, that I don't think Ford, well, maybe, uh, I think Ford's mission to win Le Mans was a mission to prove something about themselves, not, it wasn't pure, meaning it wasn't like a racer's need to win, it was a corporation's need to win, which is different, you know. Um, but, 
maybe the race to the moon in the 60s was also kind of corporate in the sense that we were competing with the Russians. And that it, was it as much about getting to the moon or getting to the moon first? And um, I think that uh, the movie tries to touch upon that. I think the, the, the effort to win a race is perhaps only pure for the racers themselves, um, not the teams or the companies that are sponsoring. Question here. Bonjour, euh, j'ai une question pour les deux acteurs. Euh, on sait depuis 20 ans à peu près euh, quels acteurs vous êtes, euh, le point de perfection que vous avez atteint dans votre travail. Je voulais savoir si vous aviez la sensation encore d'apprendre des choses sur les tournages et si sur ce tournage spécifiquement vous aviez appris quelque chose l'un de l'autre. Um, Madam and Christian, I mean, obviously, for the last 20 years, we've we've known what perfectionists you are as actors. And uh, the gentleman was wondering if you always, you still had the feeling that you could learn something on the film sets. And also, specifically on this film set, you learn things about each other. You always do every single film. Um, I, and I never trained, and so I always feel like... Uh, uh, every single job I take, I'm starting right from scratch. I don't like to imagine myself as having any particular technique or a bag of tricks or whatever that I fall back on. And that's what, I think that's what keeps me excited about it each and every time, is that it's a total reinvention. And there's also that fear about, I, I really don't know what I'm doing. You know, I've got to figure this one out. And, and uh, I guess it's uh, similar to, you know, when you haven't gone to college. You know, whatever, you feel sort of, eh. Uh, I'm surrounded by a room of people who all went to college, they're all smarter, they're all more educated than me. Um, similarly, I feel like, oh, each time I do a film, oh, I'm surrounded by people who really know what they're, they're doing, I'm just kind of bullshit my way through it. And, and, but that creates a nice creativity, you know, in itself. And then you always find out a great deal about, um, you know, each other because you're stuck in, a, in close quarters with a deadline, having to do something, it can be very intense, it can be bloody hilarious. Watching Jim with his crew is bloody hilarious. Um, um, he, he's like, I mean, him, him and Fade and Papa Michael are kind of like Shelby and Miles. Um, you know, they love each other dearly, have total respect for each other, come out with absolutely brilliant work, but bicker non-stop, and it's bloody. <laughs> All we needed for uh, inspiration was to watch Jim and, his, and, and Faden uh, do that. But, um, uh, well, what you learn about each other is that um, is that uh, they're, they're, they're obsessed as well, and it's lovely to work with people who are equally passionate and obsessive, and um, and therefore they're, uh, they're, they're not thin-skinned, you know, so that you can have passionate conversations about it and disagree without anybody getting offended and walking off, because there's no place for that um, in filmmaking. Really. Yeah, I'd definitely second that, and, and Jim creates an environment where. Uh, where everybody is throwing their ideas at him, and um, and that's and that's as it should be. You, be, you know, if you, if you suggest fifty things and and he accepts one of them, you've contributed something really important to the movie. And so, um, so I'd say I I mean I I learn I learn a ton on every movie I'm on. Every director works a little differently. It's always fascinating to watch great directors work. Um, and, and I've wanted to see Christian work in person for, since, I, since I first saw him on screen. And uh, I was really blown away. I mean, it's funny that you talk, you talk about being at all insecure in your process, because what struck me was how, first of all, a very generous, uh, actors can be selfish or generous in their, in their process, that they, that, but his is incredibly, generous and uh, helpful to all the actors around him. But when you get to work and see him, you re he'll never tell you this, but you realize that there, you can just look at him and see the thousands of hours that have gone into getting him to that point right there. And, uh, and yet, he's still completely free and available moment to moment, and uh, it was just awesome working with, with him. Question là-bas. Pour approfondir la question, justement, les deux pilotes ont le même, euh, c'est pour les acteurs, hein. les deux pilotes ont la même façon d'aborder leur, euh, leur travail, et vous, est-ce que vous travaillez de façon identique ou de façon différente Comment vous avez abordé votre travail Et je voudrais savoir quel est votre rapport aux voitures. Est-ce que vous aimez les voitures puissantes ou pépères Alors, 
les, les différences, enfin, comment ils ont abordé leur rôle, c'est ça est-ce qu'ils ont la même la façon d'aborder la même technique comme ça. les pilotes ou est-ce qu'ils ont des... des oui. Vraiment... Um, There's a question I made a bit of comparison about with pilots and whatever. Do you, do you as actors also have, like pilots in a way, certain methods of acting and relating and bonding on screen? Uh, I think... Uh, I think the methodology certainly uh, involves a lot of research and a lot of work beforehand um, so that you're, you're, you're centered in a way when you're making, when, you, when, you're, when you're actually doing it, that it's grounded in something that it also has a flexibility to it because it can change and be different from take to take or moment to moment. And uh, you'll have a lot more flexibility if you've put in a lot of work beforehand. It's not something you just show up and do. I'm assuming you don't show up and do it either like that. So it's also a question for you. Your method, I mean, you don't arrive. No, had he, had he tried thing. to show up and do it, he would have arrived like Dick Cheney at 240 pounds. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's, a, that's a big stretch from Dick Cheney, I must say. Uh, and the second part of the question was, uh, yes, you wanted to answer, uh, it's a question about your relationship to cars. And you said earlier, you, Matt, and you, that you weren't that much of car fans, really. But the question is for the three of you, I mean, now, I mean, what kind of cars do you like? Do you like the big ones, the, the fast ones, now that you've been sort of part of this world, uh, thanks to James? Well, the, I, think, I think one thing, just to, before getting to what cars we all love, um, I think one thing that Jim did so well is that you don't have to love cars to um, uh, be able to understand and associate with this movie. It's the cars are the vehicles by which these men live you know, at, at, at their peaks, you know, and to see people so alive and, and, and how much that means to them. But it's, he, Jim's done it in a very relatable way. Um, uh, I like a good pickup truck. <laughs> All right. <laughs> what about you, James? What is the kind of car you like? Uh, I have a Land Rover that I take shopping. It's very fun. The, uh, but, uh, no, you got bitten by the bug. And I, I, got a, got I got a faster a, one. I got a little faster one too. <laughs> the, uh, but uh, I'm not. It, cars are not. It's not all about cars for me either. The, but I do think cars are interesting to all of us. Like when people say, "Are you into cars?" It means, "Are you into racing?" I think. But in a way, the entire world is into cars. That the that the entire century has been defined by what cars brought each of us, which is that. Uh, independence of movement, you know, that the, that the car is, is, was this way that every man and woman had their own horse and buggy and could go wherever they wanted to go. It was a kind of, uh, and at least the affordable cars provided that for everyone. And that, the, that is a big part of how cars have changed our world. They become our identity. I mean, I always notice on the freeway that there will be someone cutting in front of many other drivers, you know, on an exit, like sticking their car out. And I'll come up later alongside and say, who is this rude bastard? And I will see like a little old lady. And I was like, uh, and it's like, well, when she's inside a steel box, she's a different person than she would be if she was at the post office. So we are all, we are, if cars allow us to all become something else, they are a kind of mask or an extension of ourselves. I mean, there's all sorts of interesting ways that cars have changed who we are, and and certainly even in, in the mid by the mid '60s, we're also kind of had a, a giantly changed um, how we relate to technology and freedom. What about you? Your sort of ideal car, the kind you drive. What is your now perception I, I of have, cars? I have a Tesla. <laughs> <laughs> My answer is not at all as philosophical as Jim's. <laughs> well, it's an honest. So right, that's what we're looking for. Question. Well. Hi guys, uh, first, thank you very much for the movie. I thought it was brilliant. Um, I was wondering how, <coughs> in knowing the faith of uh, Chevy American and Ken Morris and other than the rock, does that victory impacted your respective performances? Um, that, that finish of Le Mans 66, I think could have been an entire film by itself, couldn't it? Like you could, you could do it, 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 it to truly tell the story of all of the different complications and misunderstandings and disagreements of, and emotions of what happened right there would, would take three, four hours. And we discussed that about all that. 
we could try to get, as we do with the characters, to get the essence of what truly that signified um, uh, 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 without it becoming a historical document. Um, and, uh, but it's, 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 inc it's an incredible moment, you know, because uh, for Ken, you know, he's a purist, and for him to consider taking your foot off the gas in the slightest is absolute anathema. That's not racing. At all, so why would he do it? You know, he had achieved perhaps this this perfect lap, um, etc. But it comes back to what ultimately the film is about about friendship. He did it because of recognizing the sacrifices that Shelby had made for him, um, but without knowing the consequences about uh, what was what, what was going to happen uh, afterwards. And that is a fascinating story that uh, by itself. And I think we talked to um, <clears throat> Charlie Agapu, who was one of the, he was the youngest person on the pit crew when he was there for all of it. And, and, uh, and, he, and he said that, the, that it, it haunted uh, Shelby. Um, because they really did have an expectation that, even slowing Ken down, they did have an expectation that once, once it was announced that he came in second, they still thought they were gonna come back and win next year, and they did. They won three more years in a row. That car that they, that they built was incredible, and, and I asked Charlie, you know, how certain were you when you went to Le Mans in 66 that you were gonna win? And he said, we'd won Sebring, we won Daytona. We were 100% certain that if the car didn't break, it was, nothing could keep up with us. That car was just a thug. It was just so, it was just a great car, and, and, uh, and so, I think the expectation was, as painful as it was for Ken, I think the expectation was that the next year he was just gonna come back and win. But it was, I think, unacceptable to Ford to have Ken win the Triple Crown, because then the story, all of these millions of dollars that they put into this program to promote their cars so that people would buy their cars would be overshadowed by the brilliance of this driver, and then that would become the story, or the story would at least become bifurcated. And, they're, and I think that they made the decision that like we can't have that happen. Like it's got to be about the car. And so he was he was made to slow down. Question ici. Bonjour. D'abord félicitations pour ce ce ce, ce film qui s'accroche du début jusqu'à la fin, qui va 150 à l'heure ou 300. Même. Euh, ma question euh, s'adresse d'abord aux deux comédiens de savoir si, euh, quel a été le plus difficile dans ce film est-ce que ça a été de jouer la comédie ou de euh, conduire des voitures et euh, la deuxième question s'adresse plutôt au, au metteur en scène euh, à, à l'heure où on, on est sensibilisé à la, à, au sort de la planète, l'environnement, etc est-ce que quelque part ce film n'est pas un petit peu euh, euh, hors d'âge ou là où on, alors qu'il sanctifie le, le la voiture, la fumée, euh, le carbur la carburation, etc. Voilà. All right. Well, so, <laughs> to ask question. Well, we start with you, James. Uh, well, I mean, today, obviously, many topics about, you know, environment, the planet, the damage, obviously, the cars, I mean, everything we send in the air do to our planet. Do you feel that somehow the film is almost of time or like something as he talks about you know the glory so to speak of cars of speed of fuel etc did you consider that aspect of the film yeah we really should have had the cars run on vegetable oil. yeah there was a vegetable yeah. oil was very dirty we should have had an electric no we never considered it. no no i mean I, I, i'm concerned about these issues but i don't i don't at all see how uh anymore i don't i don't see that kind of direct uh, application to be the topic of a film and the politics of the moment. Um, uh, I think the, um, I also didn't make a movie for me that is, it, the point for me was the glorification of cars. I think that it was about a mission, about accomplishing something. Um, and uh, that would be it, yeah. And, and, and for you, uh, Christian and Matt, I mean, what was the most challenging? Was it the actual acting or was it the actual driving scenes? Um, you know, when, it, when, it, when it's going well, you know, it's nice to have a challenge. Of course you want a challenge, but when it's going well, it's, it actually feels pretty smooth. And it did on this film, you know, with the acting and, and with the driving as well, because look, they, um, they, 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 Jim's not an idiot. Um, we, we have 
incredible racing drivers who were working on this film. We have people who race Le Mans um, all the time. So um, uh, uh, absolutely, I'd, I'd love to sit here and say, yeah, I did every damn bit of racing myself, but it would not have been nearly as exciting um, as it is in the film. So, you know, you've you got to you got to let the professionals do what they do best. And then, uh, you know, I just struggle to keep up. But it's, it is intoxicating. It is very addictive. I did a little driving school with, uh, with Bob Bondron um, ahead of time, but I was under no illusion as to the fact that I was pretending to be a good racing driver rather than I am actually a good racing driver. Good to know. <laughs> uh, well, uh, I mean, a great director solves all your problems, really. So it really, like, and as, as do fellow cast members, like, I, I never felt like there was any day that got on top of me in this movie. It was like we went there knowing what we wanted to do, and at the end of every day, we kind of looked at each other and went, well, that went well. Um, so there wasn't a day that I'd want back. Sometimes you make a movie and something, you go, oh, I'd do anything to have that scene again. I, I, I see it in a different way. It wasn't making sense to me. or what, I, I, didn't, I didn't have it that day, whatever it is. But I didn't feel that way on this movie. It, it, Jim's whole kind of angle of attack felt right the whole time. and. Everybody was kind of put in a position to do their job, and uh, and everybody did. It was it was really fun. I think, like I was saying to you, Matt, earlier, the, ch the most challenging thing to me was not laughing, watching the poor bloody pit crew, the actors playing the oh, pit yeah. crew, actually trying to look like a real pit crew, right, and do it on time. That was brutal. They that was were brutal. up against it, and it's a tough thing. And they're using and period, you know, oh, the period man. stuff, and only three people at once can yes. touch the car. And, yeah. and Christian and I have a scene, and, and the camera's shooting through us, on, and in the background, these guys are changing four tires in 110 degree heat over and over and over again. It was, it was really funny in a sadistic sort of way. Yeah, right. I actually, uh, uh, turning back the question to you also, James, I mean, what was the most uh, challenging, were the driving scenes really challenging? Because when we see them on screen, they look amazing. Well, for me, shooting action, the greatest challenge is patience, because it takes a long time, you know, and, and um, not one I always succeed at. And the, um, but the other challenge, I think, is is, and I think this is always true uh, from where I sit, is that uh, if you're doing a musical, um, a, you know, even a musical biopic like I did with Walk the Line, it's very easy to think the song will do all the work. Um, when you're doing a race movie, it's easy to think that the race will do all the work, but the truth is that, uh, at least what I try and remind myself, is that the race won't do all the work. The race would be good if it were a TV sporting event, but the reason people are coming to the movie is to get inside these characters. And so I have to shoot the race or cover the race in a way um, that doesn't just function in spectacle or, is, or, or, or sensory overload, but also tracks the characters, meaning that, similar to a musical, meaning if you're tracking who Fred Astaire or Gene Kelly is in a movie, and then they t start to sing and you lose who they are, then the movie's failing. You need to stay with who they are through the song. It's the same way, it's like when you're asking Christian and Matt about acting or driving. Well, of course they're acting when they're driving, as well as when they're standing. Acting isn't talking and driving isn't driving. Acting is acting in your character when you're driving and acting in your character when you're eating, sleeping, and talking. And so. Our job, it's the reminder to yourself that the job of directing never ends, that the race itself has to be the same effort to get inside the characters' minds or hearts that you would be making if it was a scene at lunch with their child or lover or anything else. That, that, that it's actually reminding yourself that all the technology and gear is irrelevant to real, my core job, you know? Dernière question. <coughs> Sure. Hi guys, um, thank you for being here in Paris and uh, thank you for this movie, it was fantastic. Um, I have a question for Mr. Mangold. Um, many directors uh, have filmed race car movies, uh, including one award with uh, Rush. And I want to know if you watch any of, um, any of, his, um, any of these movies or uh, many uh, or race car movie for to prepare for this one, and uh, what was the your approach to film this uh, legendary of a race? Thank you. Uh, of course, I've seen. Uh, the, the truth is, there aren't that many race car movies. Um, the the so to say, I've seen them is but to say, I've seen less than ten movies. So the 
The, um, but I've seen most of them, including, by the way, uh, Bonnie Bedelia and Heart Like a Wheel, which is a great old uh, a film which I thought had a lot of heart and was really beautiful. Um, um, I, I watch all those movies. I feel like I learn from what I like and what I don't like in them. And, and, but I also feel like the smartest thing I've ever done, and I've done it instinctually, uh, not intentionally, but just, is I actually avoid watching movies that are like the movie I'm making when I'm making it. Um, it, it because it actually just, I, it fucks with my head. Like, I don't want to... And I kind of did, like, I don't think when John Ford made a Western, he watched Westerns on DVDs. So that, uh, that I, I kind of think, like, what is that habit that we're into? Like, and the, when I made, uh, when I made Girl Interrupted, I would watch The Wizard of Oz every week. You know, that was more useful to me than watching a mental institution movie. And that there's, there's just, you find different things that speak to you. Also, uh, Michael Powell's Black Narcissus, when I made that movie. Um, when I... This movie, you know, I would think as much about the work of George Roy Hill or, or Westerns or other things that might not be as obviously applicable to a race car movie. Um, because I feel like there's more of a creative jump you can take translating lessons from another genre into the one you're making. When you're watching another director meet the same kind of challenges you're meeting, you end up imitating or rejecting, which neither is a very pure um, impulse, as opposed to uh, translating or something else, which is, um, was there a second question or did I answer it? Uh, the second question was, um, what was the approach for you to film this uh, legendary of a race? I think I kind of answered it. I mean, to get in the heart of these guys. I, if there was any goal at the core of it was that I wanted to make an action film that worked for adults, which is to say it wasn't a film geared towards 12 or 13 year olds. Um, and that even some of the race car movies, I mean, I don't think it's any uh, secret that movies like Fast and Furious are not, you know, high intellectual properties. So that the, uh, the, the... Now, wait a minute. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, but, the, but, the, but the point being that we were, we, I was trying to make something that functioned as an adult drama with action, as opposed to functioning as a kind of popcorn movie only. Um, and, and so that was my kind of core focus. Thank you, action and heart. Thank yes. you very much. Thank you.